The, it is now time for question period. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is uh, for the Premier. It was revealed yesterday that the government spent nearly $12 million on contracts to friends and self-promotion through the Ontario Electricity Support Program. They doled out over $9 million to high-priced consultants and another $2.5 million to their ad men. That money was supposed to go to low-income families struggling to pay their hydro bills. Speaker, can the, can, can the Premier please tell me how, and justify how spending nearly $12 million on consultants and self-promotional ads when families are struggling to make a choice between putting food on the table and heating their homes? Um, just as an indicator, I'm going to deal with this as quickly as possible. The Minister of Children and Youth Services will come to order. Mr. Speaker, um, you know, we created the Ontario Energy Support Program to help people who were struggling with their, uh, their electricity bills, people who live on low income, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we wanted to make sure, and we want to make sure, that uh, everyone in the province who's eligible for this program will know about it, Mr. Speaker, yeah, and will understand how to access it. Right now, there are 145,000 families, Mr. Speaker, who, uh, since the program was launched 10 months ago, have uh, signed up for the program and are receiving support, therefore are paying lower electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, it, it's, it's actually beyond me how, why the Conservatives would attack a program that's actually designed to help people with their electricity bills. This is a 200. This is a two. I, uh, I've made it clear that I will be uh, seeking attention for both questions and answers. If it starts up as soon as I sit down, I'll get whoever decided to challenge. Premier? This is a $225 million Answer. program, Mr. Speaker. $12 million to do the public education is a small fraction of that amount, Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Well, 145000 is a less than a third of those eligible. The people, the people are waiting, but your friends have done very well. Member from Glengarry Prescott Russell, the Minister of Education, the uh, pre President of the Treasury Board, and the Deputy Premier will come to order. And the list will grow. Please finish. There's not a day goes by where I don't hear another hydro horror story. Another family struggling to keep the lights on. A senior who can't afford their medications. Okay, can't afford their medications or their pay their bills. We hear all of those stories over and over again, and this government has the gall, the audacity to spend $12 million on high-priced consultants and self-promotional ads. Mr. Speaker, this government knows no bounds. Can the Premier tell every senior struggling to pay their hydro bills or their medications that paying Question. consultants was more important than their welfare? member for the question. He makes the point that it is very important that people who are struggling on the from Nipissing, bills, come to order. that they have access to support. Mr. Speaker, there are some 300,000 people in the province who still would qualify for the, the Ontario Energy Support Leeds Program, Mr. Brindle, Mr. Speaker, and we order. need to make sure that they know about that program. So what, what we have done, Mr. Speaker, is we have put ad advertisements in print and radio and bus shelters. Uh, we've um, Next time I stand, we'll go to warnings, but the member from Leeds Grenville, second time. Finish, please. We put notices in uh, ODSP and Ontario work checks, Mr. Speaker, uh, inserts from local uh, utilities, Mr. Speaker, with their bills, partnerships with food banks, libraries, and MPP offices, Mr. Answer. Speaker. So I hope that the MPP has a, a poster in his office and helps people in his constituency so. to find out about the program. Thank you. Fine. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The inserts cost next to nothing. The ads of 2.5 million were for your self-promotion. What I can't understand is why this rebate wasn't automatically given to those in need. Why were they forced to apply? Why waste $12 million? But the Premier and Minister think that this $12 million was worth it. Or as the Minister said yesterday, that it was money well spent. And if the Liberals think that it was better to spend on consultants and ads, they should have no problem releasing the details. 
Speaker, will the Premier commit today to release every contract and the details, disclose all the details of how this $12 million was spent? As I said, this the money that was spent to uh, put in place a public education campaign was very necessary because there are 500,000 families in the province, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, who would be eligible. About 145,000 families the member are now from on the Sound. So that means there are still more families who would qualify. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows perfectly well that utilities do not have personal income information, Mr. Speaker, yeah. so it was necessary to set in place a program approach that allowed people to, uh, to apply. I hope, Mr. Speaker, that the member opposite is letting his constituents know about this program, Mr. Speaker. It's very important, and the, uh, the opposition has said— We're now moving to warnings. The member from Bruce, Huron Bruce and the member from Halliburton, Cortho Lakes, Brock, Come to order. You're in before the warning. You're lucky. It has been more than clear, Mr. Speaker, that uh, there are people who are struggling with electricity bills. I hope that they are pointing people who come into their constituency offices in the direction of this program so that those people can get help. Mr. Thank Speaker. you. New question. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, due to the rationed health care system, Wait times in southwestern Ontario are increasing and patients are suffering. Last year, I informed the House that hip and knee replacement surgeries were completely cancelled during the months of January to April due to lack of funds. Now, Mr. Speaker, constituents like Ruby and Betty in my riding need to travel over an hour to Strathroy for knee replacement surgery. However, they both received letters from their surgeons this past week. Our funding that we received for this fiscal year of 2016 through March 2017 has reached its maximum, and therefore we're not able to book any further patients for total knee or total hip replacements for this fiscal year. Speaker, we're only six months into this fiscal year and we've already run out of money. Mr. Speaker, constituents like Ruby and Betty are suffering because of this ration care. When will the Premier step in and ensure that health care funding lasts year-round? Serve health and long-term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. Uh, we know that uh, when it comes to surgical procedures in this province, that for most surgeries, we have uh, the shortest wait time or among the shortest wait times in all of Canada, Mr. Speaker. But there are areas. We have to be uh, frank uh, about this, that there are areas where we need to continue to uh, make further improvements. Uh, and also, we need to make sure that that, that that success is well distributed across the province. We do expect our hospitals, when they are provided with an allocation, for them to manage that allocation responsible, responsibly and actually spread it over the course of the year, because there are many surgical procedures that demand those OR times, and we, we expect and look to our hospital officials and leadership to be able to manage those allocations appropriately. And we do that Sir? using an evidence-based approach and a scientific approach approach to make sure that people do have access when they do need that access. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Life is getting harder for Doug Price. The pre 73-year-old needs a replacement surgery on his knee today. Sadly, he can't have it, and he won't get it for at least another year. His wife, Doris, faced the same predicament when she was told to wait a year for her cataract surgery. Delayed and cancelled surgeries are skyrocketing across our province as a result of this Liberal government's scandal, waste and mismanagement. Mr. Speaker, it's unacceptable that this government can't fund surgeries for patients like Doug Price, who are in constant pain and unable to leave their home. Why haven't the Premier and Minister acted on this crisis situation and found a solution so that patients can get the needed surgeries as soon as possible? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, we, uh, we increased our budgets of our hospitals this year by more than 2%. Uh, and we continue to make investments, and we often do that so there's the base funding that we provide hospitals, but also to reduce wait times, we specifically allocate funds across this province. And we do that generally through uh, what's called a quality-based procedure, where we 
We provide that funding to hospitals who have proven their efficiency, their effectiveness in delivering these services as well. Uh, so it's a system that has actually seen pretty dramatic improvements over just a few number of years. So we can be proud how we're situated vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the country. But we know that there's more work to be done. And we know, and in fact, for the Southwest Lynn, as an example, we provided them with significant new funding specifically for hip and knee surgery yes, this fiscal year. We're working closely with the Lynn in Southwest and in other parts of the province to be able to manage those challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary my question is to the Premier. We are joined today by Rethink Breast Cancer, which is a national non-profit organization whose mission is to empower those who are concerned about and affected by breast cancer. They have been advocating for improved access to breast reconstruction for women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer and those who are at high risk of getting it. According to a report they republished earlier this year, Ontario currently has a one to two year wait list for breast reconstruction surgery. This is simply unacceptable and harmful to breast cancer survivors. Manitoba, by contrast, has wait times of only up to six months for the same procedure. Wow. Wow. Fully half of physicians in Ontario surveyed say they are dissatisfied with the patient wait times for breast reconstruction, and 80 per cent of those surveyed felt a lack of operating room time was the biggest contributor to the long wait times. Mm -hmm. Will the Premier Question. commit to immediately increasing surgical resources in the province, such as OR time, so that women suffer from breast cancer can back to their living their thank lives you. normally. Minister. Well, thank you. Uh, I particularly uh, appreciate this question. And I want to thank, uh, I know we have uh, individuals uh, in the gallery, um, and, uh, I, but I want to, uh, I want to thank uh, Rethink Breast Cancer for their recent paper, which highlights the challenges that are faced. There are, th this is such an important issue, Mr. Speaker, that we need to make uh, further progress on this. In April of this year, and I think this was one of the problems, uh, this was a, uh, the reconstruction, whether it's prophylactic or whether it's following surgery for cancer, it wasn't governed or managed by Cancer Care Ontario. In April of this year, we made that change. As a result, so we've had an expert panel looking at precisely this challenge because it is unacceptably long for women who have to go through this traumatic physical and mental uh, uh, procedure, the challenges that they're facing. We owe them. Answer. We're obligated to make sure that we're providing a better system and better support to them. We're making the changes to deliver just that. Thank you. Any questions? The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. It's particularly my pleasure to direct my question to the Premier today on Persons Day, the day that 87 years ago women were actually included in the definition of being a person in this country. And so I'll continue with the actual question, Speaker. Ontarians are very proud of our health care system, and they want to know that it's going to be there for their kids and for the next generations. But they're very, very worried, Speaker, about privatization. The Premier has made some comments, and I just need to be firmly sure of where this Liberal government is going. And so I'm going to ask the Premier to tell us clearly, is privatization of any or all of our e-health assets on the table for this Liberal government? Mr. Speaker, let me just acknowledge that the, uh, the leader of the third party was at uh, the Leave Persons Day breakfast this morning with a number of her colleagues and a number of mine, and to, uh, to thank her and to thank everyone who has supported Leaf over the years as they work to make sure that the law works for women and not against women. So happy Persons Day, everyone. Speaker, as I have said, as the Deputy Premier has said, sure. personal health information, e-health, is not for sale, Mr. Speaker, not now and not again. Supplementary. Speaker, last week the government asked Ed Clark to figure out how much money our e-health assets are worth. Now they insist that all they want to do is strengthen health care. But you don't improve health care, Speaker, by asking how much you can get to sell off a hospital, and you don't need to know the sale price of e-health in order to be able to improve it, Speaker. Why should Ontarians trust this Premier that she isn't privatizing our e-health assets? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, to reiterate, there is no possibility of 
a sale or the commercialization of people's health information. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, what I asked Ed Clark to do last week was to to value the assets, to actually take an inventory of what's being created by eHealth over the past roughly decade. I'm trying to remember. Did I say we're in warnings? Thank you. I just needed that reminder. Carry on. So I think it's prudent, Mr. Speaker, given that the current mandate of eHealth is due to uh, conclude at December of next year, I think it's prudent actually to do an inventory of the assets, to value those assets, to understand what assets have been created across this province. We know others like Canada Health InfoWay has done, has done such. We want to do that to leverage those assets going forward to build an even stronger digital health strategy and system. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I'm more worried than I was when I got up to ask these questions in the first place. That's the same language this government used when they talked about selling off Hydro One, leveraging the assets. Look, it wasn't that, that long ago, Speaker, that this Premier refused to admit that Hydro One was even for sale in the province of Ontario. In fact, she still insists that Hydro One isn't being sold. She calls it broadening the ownership, even though everybody knows what the truth is, Speaker. So when the Liberals ask Ed Clark to figure out the sale price of our e-health assets and then turn around and say they won't sell anything, it doesn't pass the smell test, Speaker, especially when they're not now talking about leveraging that very asset. They've seen more than 10 years, we've seen more than 10 years of privatization by this Liberal Question. government in the health care sector, and we cannot take any more. Why is this Premier so interested in how much money she can get Thank for you. our public e-health e -health assets? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, it doesn't matter how many times she tries to say it. E-health is not for sale. E-health is not for sale. And so what we're doing is we're actually looking at what has been created over the past roughly decade. We're moving into a new phase of a strategy where we're going to be able to provide provide uh, better support for consumer-facing e-health and digital health systems. We're going to build on the fact that 80 percent of family doctors across this province are already using e-health, that, that most diagnostic procedures are already digitized. We're going to look at that. It's the prudent thing to do. The mandate is coming to a conclusion at the end of next year. It's prudent to actually look at what we've got so we can build an even stronger system going forward, Mr. Speaker. We will not be selling e-health. Thank you. New question, the My next uh, question is also for the Premier Speaker, but I got to say, in October of 2014, this Premier said she wasn't selling off Hydro One, and look where we are now. Yeah. But on Monday, you know what? I sat down with a woman named uh, Marise Gallo. Marise lives in Sudbury with her husband Chad and her two beautiful young daughters. Marise has watched her hydro bills go up by nearly $100 since the same time last year. The cost of hydro means that they cannot save for their kids' future. And she's concerned about whether she can afford even entering them in uh, before and after school programs, like sports, for example. Like people all across Ontario, the sell-off of Hydro One means life is getting tougher for folks like Marie's, her husband Chad, and their daughters. And it means it's harder for them to give the, the future that they want to give to their children. She's actually not putting money away in their RESPs because she's taking that money and using it Question. for her hydro bills. Will the Premier stop the sell-off of Hydro One so it doesn't get worse instead of better? Thank you. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, again, I thank the leader of the third party for the question, and I know that it serves the uh, leader of the third party's interest to conflate these subjects, Mr. Speaker. I know that she's trying, she tries to make a link between electricity prices and uh, the changes with Hydro One. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that we have made massive investments in the electricity system in Ontario. We have shut down the coal-fired plants. We have built over 10,000 kilometres of line, Mr. Speaker, and we've done that so that we could have a clean grid in this province, a reliable grid, Mr. Speaker, and there's a cost associated with that, and we've recognized that, and so we are working to take costs off of people's bills, Mr. Speaker, and help people like Marie's and her family. We are also working to help a family like that so that they have the supports that they need, whether it's 
with child care, Mr. Speaker, 100,000 new spaces in, of uh, child care spaces, whether it's tuition, Mr. Speaker, making sure that by the time those two Answer. kids get to post-secondary, they have the support that they need, whether it's a free tuition if they're low income, Mr. Speaker, or supports that they Thank need. You. Those are the kinds of things we're doing to support families. Speaker, the Minister of Energy, the MPP for Sudbury, stood right here in this House and said, quote, a 20 per cent reduction for families in rural, remote and northern communities, like in my part of the province, will actually be a significant savings for many families, end quote. But people in Sudbury, Speaker, people in the Minister's own riding, people like Marie's and Chad, are not getting those savings. Instead, they're watching their bills go up and turning Hydro One into a private for-profit monopoly is only going to make it worse, regardless of what the Premier claims. We've seen it happen over and over and over in virtually every jurisdiction across North America. When you privatize your electricity system, the costs go up for the public. That's what happens, whether she likes to admit it or not. So the question is, question. will this Premier stop any further sell-off of Hydro One and ensure that people get a break? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to rise and answer the uh, Leader of the Third Party's question. When it comes to uh, the Great Riding of Sudbury, we have talked to the families there, and all the families in the Great Riding of Sudbury will be receiving that 8 per cent reduction, Mr. Okay. Speaker, if this legislation passes today. Part of the issue, Mr. Speaker, is that the NDP doesn't have a plan when it comes to energy, so they don't understand the whole process. Mr. Speaker, when we're talking about northeastern Ontario, my part of the province, there are over 69,000 families, Mr. Speaker, that will be receiving that benefit. Mr. Speaker, and we're very proud of that, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to Hydro One, we can talk about we're on track, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we're going to realize the target of $9 billion generated through the IPO. And let's talk about Greater Sudbury again, Mr. Speaker. We can talk about investment after investment after investment. $173 million for four lighting of 69, $26 million for Maley Drive, $20 million through OSIF, Mr. Speaker. This is fantastic for the North, and I'm very proud of these. We are, uh, we are at warnings, cupping your hands to make sure a megaphone makes it louder <laughs> it is not conducive to applying what the speaker is looking for, and it also is not helpful when someone's giving an answer that the chipping comes on from the same side that provokes, so it stops on both sides. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. You know, it's not just people. Speaker, this is Ontario Small Business Week. Small businesses across the province cannot afford their hydro bill, Speaker, wherever I go, whether it's Sudbury, whether it's Kingston, whether it's Hamilton, whether it's right here in Toronto, Niagara, you name it, Speaker. I talk to small businesses everywhere, and they're all telling me the cost of hydro is the difference between growing or going out of business. According to the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, one in three small businesses, one in three, say the cost of hydro has a negative impact on their ability to invest in the future of this province by investing in their businesses. They simply can't do it. Will this Premier give some hope and confidence to small business people and start getting hydro costs under control by stopping the sell-off of our hydro system, stopping the sell-off of Hydro One. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like uh, to thank the member for highlighting small businesses and the importance of small businesses, because we recognize that on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. And let's take a look at a couple of examples, Mr. Speaker, about the programs that we are offering and how they support small businesses. Uh, Donnelly's Irish Pub in Barrie took advantage of, uh, you know, the business refrigeration initiatives offered through PowerStream, Mr. Speaker, and they received more than $2,500 in one-time incentives, and will save them $2,400 annually on energy. Uh, Arbor Memorial, a funeral company, has its head office in Toronto. They used incentives from the Save on Energy program to green their office, upgrading their intensive HVAC system. $100,000 per year in savings, Mr. Speaker. Canada Malton Company up in Thunder Bay, one of the very first announcements that I was able to attend, Mr. Speaker, through the Save on Energy program. They got $25 or $2.5 million back. They're saving a million dollars a year, Mr. Speaker, in their energy programs. We get small business on this. 
satisfied, Mr. Speaker, and we help small businesses. Your question, the member from Huron Bruce. Thank you, Speaker. My Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. Member from Huron Bruce. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. A constituent of Huron Bruce recently called me about a 73 year old wife who needs to have orthopedic surgery. She has been waiting since July 2015 for surgery on her knee. Speaker, that's 15 months, and frankly, that's unacceptable. My office called the surgeon, and we talked to their staff, and we were told that they actually have 300 people on a wait list, some for as long as two years. Speaker, the surgeon's office explained that the wait times are due to government regulations, which dictate, although a surgeon is available, they are only to perform surgeries as funding permits. Speaker, why should people's quality of life have to be put on hold because of this Premier's wasteful spending and mismanagement? Speaker, what I would like to know, what does the Premier have to say Question. to these people? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm the first to admit that there's more work to be done, but we need to recognize exactly where we're situated here in Ontario. We have among the best wait times. We're the first to have measured them, by the way. We have among the best surgical wait times in the entire country. And in fact, in the last decade, we have decreased the wait time for hip replacement by 42 percent, Mr. Speaker. We've decreased the wait time for knee replacements by 51 percent, Mr. Speaker. We've decreased the wait time for cataract surgery by 37 percent. So there's dramatic improvements. In fact, for hip and knee, more than 80 percent of individuals achieve those uh, those replacements within our targeted uh, amount of time that we we aim for what's called a level four target mr speaker but there is more work to be done but we also expect to be able to work with our hospitals and our clinicians yeah. so that those patients who do require those procedures more urgently are able to get access to those surgeries those surgeries urgently thank you supplementary the member from york central thank you and back to the premier Premier, my constituent, Duncan Drummond, has been on the emergency wait list for so sh shoulder surgery for over seven months, an emergency list which, upon investigation, we find is 100 people long. A hundred people are waiting on an emergency list. At this rate, it will be another two years. He is number 101. And his uh, granddaughter describes his condition as a pseudo paralysis on an arm that leaves him in agonizing pain. Mr. Duncan's wife and daughter are here today in the hope that you will understand how important it is for him to be moved along at a faster rate than at this time. To the Premier, when will you exercise your constitutional obligation? to provide health care for my constituents and the rest of the province. Yeah, yeah. Minister of health. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to acknowledge the Duncan family uh, being here today. And this is an important issue, and I'm pleased that they uh, are able to see the discussion. And we need to continue to improve, there's no question. But for those individuals that do urgently require procedures, we expect clinicians and hospitals to be able to put them to the, the top of the list, Mr. Speaker. And we, we have made significant improvements. We continue to do that. We continue to invest millions of dollars in bringing down wait times. But when you look at knee replacements alone, our wait time, average wait time, is half of what it is in the OECD, Mr. Speaker. Our, for hip replacements, the OECD, the Economic uh, Countries, uh, the, the Organization of Economic uh, Development, uh, their average wait time for hip replacements is 121 days. Canada's is 85 days for hip replacement. Here in Ontario, it is 70 days. Answer. So we are at the front of the line, Mr. Speaker, but there, of course, is always more work to be done in concert with our frontline clinicians and surgeons themselves. Thank you. New question. The member from Bramall Lee Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 
Mr. Mr. Speaker, in 2013, this government promised to reduce auto insurance rates by 15 per cent. The rates didn't come down. They campaigned on this promise in 2014, and again, no surprise, the rates didn't come down. But in fact, what's going on is, for the second quarter in a row in 2016, rates are actually going up. But what makes this even more offensive, Mr. Speaker, is that our benefits have been slashed, and this government has allowed the insurance industry to slash benefits. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is has the government just given up on this promise to reduce auto insurance? Thank you. Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question and the concerns that we all have about reducing auto insurance rates, about ensuring there's fairness in the system, about ensuring that consumers are well protected. Ontario continues to be the most generous in terms of benefits still. But we have reduced rates. They have been going down on average uh, almost 10 percent, Mr. Speaker, and that's important. And it's, and it's not at a point in time that matters. It's on an ongoing basis to provide sustainable reductions in the costs, in the fraud, in, in uh, the, the engagements of certain uh, activities within the sector that have to be improved. And that is being done. It's being done in consultations with the sector. It's being done with consultations with the public. And all in all, consumers are demanding greater affordability and they want choice. And Ontario is providing both, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the reality is, over the past two quarters, this government has approved rate increases. They've approved it. Now, the reality is the government controls rates. They have the ability to control auto insurance rates in this province, and they're simply not doing it. What they are, in do what they are doing, though, is allowing the insurance industry to exploit the people of this province. They've allowed them to slash benefits so tremendously. And what's so offensive is it's not just all people of Ontario. It's even the most seriously injured people who are seeing their protection slashed. Now, the government claimed that this was a stretch goal. They never really intended to achieve this goal anyways, but that's not what the people voted for. The people want to ensure that the next generation has an affordable life, that they can afford to live in this province, but it's not helping when rates continue to increase. When will the government stop prioritizing insurance company profits Question. over protecting the people of Ontario and finally commit to affordable auto insurance rates in this province? Thank you. Mr. No, Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is auto insurance rates on average are going down. That's just simply not true what the member said. Uh, on occasions, there are points where rates vary depending upon specific, uh, specific companies. And there are over 110 companies that participate in this, uh, in this industry. But all in all, Mr. Speaker, reforms have been put in place. Programs have, en have enabled us to further reduce rates overall. Um, we are improving the degree of of uh, victims who get the responses in a timely manner. That was also a problem, Mr. Speaker. Um, that is being done. And we have been doing a lot of work in regards to trying to reform the system to provide better service to consumers and victims, but at the same time providing for greater affordability. And it's being done on a number of reforms that have been acted and that are continuing to be so. And some of them were delayed, Mr. Speaker, yes, because sir. members of the opposition and that party specifically voted against measures that would have enabled us to act more quickly. Thank you. We are doing what's necessary, Mr. Speaker. Auto rates are going Your down question? overall. The member from Barry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. This week, provincial and territorial health ministers from across Canada met with Federal Health Minister Jane Philpott and Indigenous leadership in Toronto to discuss several key aspects of health care. From what I have seen in media reports, much of the discussions were on the future of the federal health transfer. I know that the federal government has a role to pl play in the sustainable funding of our health care system, not only in Ontario but across Canada. Would the minister be able to provide us with an update of those very important discussions? Thank you, Minister Health Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We had an excellent uh, two days of meeting uh, uh, here in Toronto with my uh, provincial, uh, territorial, and, and then yesterday federal health minister colleagues. Uh, and, Mr. Speaker, although we didn't agree on, on everything, we did agree that a stable financial base 
uh, is essential for all of the provinces and territories to be able to continue to provide the uh, high quality services that we do. And I know that Minister Philpott agrees with that as well. We had an excellent two hour session with national Indigenous uh, leaders and their organizations uh, yesterday morning. Uh, it was powerful to hear from them and the specific uh, recommendations and proposals that they put forward. Uh, it's important to note, because I think most Ontarians don't understand this, is that 80, roughly 80 percent of the dollars that go towards health care across this country, 80 percent of it is provided by the provinces Answer. and territories, only about 20 percent by the federal government. We're hoping to maintain that federal share. We think that's the fair approach to take. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for that response. I also believe it is important that we have a strong federal partner, finally, in order to sustainably fund health care in Ontario, and I look forward to further updates. Minister, would you be able to inform the House how incoming funds are directed entirely towards improving health care for Ontarians? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, historically, 50 years ago this year, Medicare was created in this uh, great country, and there was a commitment to share 50 percent, 50 percent between the federal government and the uh, provincial uh, and territorial governments. That has declined down, as I mentioned, to about 20 percent being the federal contribution. We want uh, we want not to maintain that, but to bring it back to where it used to be in terms of the historical uh, partnership that did it, did agree. But I want to reassure Ontarians that that. Every Every single dollar that we get through the Canada Health Transfer for health care from the federal government goes to health care. When you look at, uh, um, in Ontario, that contribution now from the federal government amounts to about 1.5% of our annual health budget that we get from the federal government. And of course, as many uh, of you know, that in many years our budget for health has gone up by 5 or 6, sometimes even 7%. Mr. Yes, sir. Speaker, it certainly has consistently been above 1.5%. So we're looking for a fair relationship. We're looking for an increase to the federal Thank contribution, you. so it res re respects history. Okay, new question, the member from the PM Carlton. Thank you very much. Uh, speaker, my question is as well to the Minister of Health. In Ottawa, we have the second longest wait times in Ontario for MRIs. The government says that 90 per cent of those needing a, quote, non-urgent MRI should get it within 28 days, but the Champlain Lynn said it could take up to 132 days, not 28. Um, Ottawa's hospital CEO, Jack Kitts, also told the Ottawa Sun, quote, without more resources, I don't want to leave you with any misconception that going from 132 days to 28 is realistic. And according to the Ottawa Citizen, the government also won't pay the operating costs for the Ottawa Heart Institute's new MRI. So the government is failing my constituents and the people in Ottawa Vanier who will be going to the polls on November 17th with unachievable targets because of unavailable cash. Why is this government setting targets it can't meet Question. because of payments that they won't make to operate these MRIs in Ottawa? Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to, to consult with my colleagues because I understand that the member opposite was at the Queensway Carleton announcement last Friday with the Premier, where we announced a fantastic new senior-specific. It's called an ACE clinic, which will make a dramatic impact. You were very. I know you were very happy with that investment. I know you're very happy with that investment, Mr. Speaker. And so, when it comes to MRI, you know. I, I, I will definitely address the issue substantially now and in the supplementary, but we are making considerable progress. Again, on MRIs and CAT scans and ultrasounds, we're either at the top in terms of the shortest wait times in Canada or very near the, 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 uh, the shortest wait times. Uh, we're measuring them and we're making significant progress, uh, Mr. Speaker. We're, we're, we, we realize that, that we need to continue to invest, particularly in these important diagnostic procedures, and we need to make sure that those that need the procedure most urgently get it Thank most you. urgently. Supplementary, the member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Isaac Krauss of Thornhill has worked in Canada most of his life, and he paid his taxes. But now he's 62 years old and diabetic. He had a family doctor for 30 years who suddenly retired, and Isaac said he panicked. He knew what was ahead, Mr. Speaker. He tried to find a new family doctor, and he was called in for interviews as though he was applying for a job and rejected. He believes that doctors did not want to take him into their practice due to his diabetes. 
Mr. Speaker, does the Premier understand the challenges faced by patients with diabetes and other illnesses in this province? Thank you. Minister of Health. Well, Mr. Speaker, we expect all our primary providers to, to welcome uh, individuals into their practice, regardless of what their medical history might be. In fact, it would be unethical to do anything but that, Mr. Speaker. So, so I don't know the specific uh, case, but I have to ask the question, with all of the questions coming this way on wait times in terms of access to family doctors, in fact, we have 900 new, net new practicing physicians that work in this province each and every year, but I have to ask the question if wait times are so important. If hospital investments are so important, MRIs are so important, why the heck did that party vote against our budget this spring with a $345 million investment in, in health care, Mr. Speaker? It begs the question, if it was so important to them now, why wasn't it important to them then, Mr. Speaker? New question, the member from London, Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The Minister of Health just said that the average wait times for hip and knee surgeries is 70 days in Ontario, while people in London are waiting nearly four times as long for hip and knee replacement, and the Ministry of Health reports on their website the provincial wait time is currently 209 days. But my constituent, Jean Cassidy, has been waiting three hundred days for her surgery, and that's not counting the time she spent waiting just to see a surgeon in the first place. That's right. If surgeries are cancelled again in London like they were last year, Jean will be waiting until April to get the surgery she's needed for more than a year. When will the Premier admit there's a wait Question. time crisis in London and step up to fix it now for people like Jean? Care. Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciate the question, and I appreciate the fact that the member opposite has has repeatedly brought this forward uh, and brought it to our attention. It's an important issue. Uh, it's it's um, when it comes to the Southwest Lynn, we are working very closely with the Southwest Lynn as we speak, Mr. Speaker, to to make sure that access to uh, surgeries, including hip and knee replacement, for example, that they are provided uh, when they're required. And and part of that is a triage, right? That as I've repeated, that those who urgently do need that procedure need to go to the top of the list, and that is up to the clinician and the hospital to be able to make those arrangements. There's also the opportunity through the Lynn to talk to the Lynn because there are different surgeons that provide this. Some have longer wait lists than others. Some work longer hours than others. There are different hospitals that have different wait lists as well. Working with the Lynn and with their primary care provider or their specialist, they can often find ways to dramatically shorten that wait time. Having said that, I am working closely with London, with the Southwest Lynn, and I'll speak to more in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I'd like to hear the Premier's answer to that. No matter where you live in Ontario, you should be able to get the surgery you need without having to wait for months on end. I've spoken to Dr. Rajkapal, an orthopedic surgeon in Strathroy, who is incredibly frustrated by the pain that his patients are forced to live with because of the Liberal government's decisions. Every day, he sees patients who are waiting far longer than they should have to for surgeries that they need. And he has a simple question for the Premier. Why won't this Liberal government properly fund surgeries for patients in London and across the southwestern Ontario when our wait lists are out of control? Thank you. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, it, um, there's nothing more important to me than to work towards providing services and procedures when people need them in a timely fashion. I work every day to achieve that end. I am working with the Lynn, the Southwest Lynn, with the hospitals involved in the London area as well, and I expect in the very near future we will have arrived at a solution which uh, the member opposite, I think, can have confidence is going to uh, result uh, address the issue that she's addressed appropriately today. Um, we, uh, we have made significant investments. We have seen dramatic, uh, to the order of 50 percent, declines in wait times over the past decade. We've invested $2 
$1.8 billion just in wait time uh, reductions in the last uh, roughly decade uh, in this province. With regards to the Southwest Lynn, I'm working yes, directly with them. I expect in the coming days we'll have a solution that the member opposite can have confidence in. Thank you. New question. The member from Beaches East Coast. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Speaker, as you know, small businesses are an important and core part of the engine of our economy, and they provide many good paying jobs for companies, for people across Ontario. And in my riding, Beaches East York, we know that we thrive on the success of our small business and our entrepreneurs, and we have organizations like DECA, the Danforth East Community Asso Association, that help small businesses in pop up shops and retail malls to get their businesses started. For 25 years, Speaker, as you know, I worked as a self employed consultant, assisting many small businesses with their growth, and I also co founded a number of small businesses which continue to employ people to this day, so I understand the challenges faced by small businesses in Ontario. So, Speaker, this week is Small Business Week. We've had some conversations already about how important the small business owners are to our economy, and we are celebrating their continuing contribution. Question. So, Speaker, can the minister advise this legislature about what our government is doing to help small businesses compete Thank and you. grow globally? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Mr. Speaker, this is a great week to acknowledge the fact that Ontario is now producing some of the best startups, some of the best small businesses that are producing some of the most sought after innovation anywhere in North America today. But, Mr. Speaker, that's not happening by accident. That's happening because we've taken a number of measures to help small businesses reduce their costs. For instance, Mr. Speaker, we completely eliminated the capital tax, saving small businesses hundreds of millions of dollars. And I ask you, Mr. Speaker, were the opposition on side with us when we did that? Absolutely not. No. Mr. Speaker, we've reduced the corporate tax rate for small businesses. That's given them a 13 percent advantage south of the border. The NDP want us to jack that rate up even further. We're not going to do that, Mr. Speaker, because we support our small businesses. Mr. Speaker, we brought in the HST. Tough political decision. Answer. Well, Mr. Speaker, that is saving businesses hundreds of millions of dollars, and the NDP don't want them to have that savings. They're still Thank not you. supporting that, Mr. Speaker. We're Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker. I am delighted to hear this minister talk about all the incredible programs that we're putting in place to help small businesses grow and compete globally. And it just shows that we in Ontario are focusing on helping businesses stay ahead in the global economy. And in Beaches East York, I can tell you that many small businesses are saying that the best thing that governments can do is to reduce a necessary burden. And sometimes, Speaker, governments just have to get out of the way and let those who are creating the jobs do their job. And I know that the minister has been recognized numerous times nationally for his commitments to reducing unnecessary regulatory burdens. And so while we celebrate the progress that we've made, I know what small businesses really want to hear is what else we are planning to do to help Ontario be more competitive and support the creation of small business and jobs across Ontario. So, Speaker, will the minister Question. tell us about the initiatives he is taking to make Ontario a global leader in reducing red tape and the cost associated with operating small businesses. Thank, Thank you, you Speaker. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I know the member has been a, been a very valuable spokesman uh, person for small business for many years, and I thank him for his leadership in that area. And he would know that we are absolutely passionate about making Ontario the easiest place in North America, if not the world, in which to invest and operate a small business. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we, we've completely restructured our government and how we, re, how we regard regulatory burden. We've established a regulatory modernization committee that starts from the top up, Mr. Speaker. Our Secretary of Cabinet, Ned Clark, uh, are, are sort of the, the siphon where all good ideas come through to ensure we can move at the pace of business, Mr. Speaker. So it doesn't take us five years to initiate a good idea, but takes us, Mr. Speaker, a matter of weeks, if not months. Mr. Speaker, we set up a regulatory center for excellence to root out and eliminate red tape. And we set up our red yes, tape sir. challenge, Mr. Speaker, where we're tackling sector by sector uh, challenges that small business face. We're determined to reduce the regulatory burden for small business and make Ontario more competitive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your question, member from Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Constituents tell me they've been stranded on wait lists for, for uh, necessary surgeries. In the last year alone, I've heard from 10 people forced to wait in pain for hip and knee replacements, back surgery, thyroid cancer surgery, and a stem cell transplant. Andy is one of them. 
Before he got in touch with my office, he was told it could take two years for hip replacement surgery. And he said it best. I just don't get the incompetence of the health system within Ontario, and I hold the Ministry of Health totally responsible for this inept process. Underfunded, unprepared, and unsympathetic. Is this the kind of system that the Premier is proud of? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm starting to sound like a broken record here. That um, it still boggles the mind, Mr. Speaker, why they would vote against. In fact, of that $345 million in new money to go towards our hospitals alone, let, let alone the billion dollars that we added to the health care system, which they didn't support either element, but a significant part of that $345 million was invested specifically and wholly and entirely in further bringing down wait times for yeah. important procedures yeah. like hip and knee and back surgery, Mr. Speaker. We, we, so that aside, we are continuing. We've made, I would describe it as dramatic progress, where we're the, the best or among the best in Canada. We're Answer. better than many, many jurisdictions around the world. Do we have more work to do? Of course. That's why we're making these investments. Thank you. It's unfortunate they didn't support them. Supplementary. Remember from Lambert. Back to the Premier. A constituent from my riding, Joe, had a consultation for hip surgery at Strathroy Hospital in September 2015. Last month, 12 months later, he was informed that the earliest he might expect the surgery would be April 2017, but likely much later. Speaker, this is a minimum 560-day wait. But while residents of Strathroy wait and wait, many who seek care elsewhere in the province are experiencing average waits fewer than 80 days. Mr. Speaker, residents of Strathroy are concerned about this Liberal government's rationing of care, where one region appears to be getting better health care than another. Do you agree that wait times for my constituents would be reduced if you funded health care for residents of Strathroy at the same rate that you fund health care elsewhere in Ontario? Question. Thank you. Minister of Health. Well, Mr. Oh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I have to draw the line, Mr. Speaker, yeah. because when they were in power, Mr. Speaker, they didn't even measure wait times. But when we came, when we came into government and started measuring wait times, we found that their wait times were the worst in Canada, the Mr. Worst. Speaker. The worst. The worst. When you now they're the best, the Mr. Speaker. They are the best. And the yeah. Wait Time yeah. Alliance report card on wait times. Mr. Speaker, the Wait Time Alliance report card on wait times from the Fraser Institute, which you'll like, notes that Ontario continues to receive straight A's for wait times in five key service areas hip replacement air surgery, knee replacement surgery, cataract procedures, cancer radiation, and coronary artery bypass graft. The Fraser Institute says we're getting straight A's on precisely the issue that they've been raising all morning, Mr. Speaker. I think it's reprehensible that they voted against a budget that would have made further improvements, and they're trying to discredit a process where we've seen Answer. dramatic improvement verified by independent yeah. third parties. Yeah. 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 you see it, please? you see it, please? Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is for the Premier. Yesterday's City of Toronto report on childcare demand and affordability highlights what families across this province have known for years, Speaker, and that is access to affordable childcare in this province has reached a tipping point. Three quarters of Toronto's families can't afford licensed childcare, which costs an average of $22,000 a year. That's unacceptable, uh, Speaker. Parents are being forced to delay uh, going back to work because they can't find a childcare spot for their child, but far too often it's also because they simply can't afford to pay for those spaces. Childcare is beyond the reach of most family these days. The Premier must do better by the families of this province. When will this government deal with the affordability crisis in our child care sector? Thank you. Thank you. Associate Minister of Education responsible for uh, early years in child care. Chief Minister of Education. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for that very important question. And I'm pleased to talk about our plan. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker, we understand that Ontario families are facing challenges when it comes to finding affordable childcare in the province, and that's why we are making a historic investment. But that's also why affordability has been front and centre in the conversations that we have been having about childcare. Let me just talk a little bit about our commitment. We are committing to create. 100,000 new childcare spaces for children zero to four years old. That is an historic investment, an investment that also means that absolutely will include childcare subsidies to support families. This conversation cannot happen without answer. talking about affordability. And so I'm pleased to answer and talk a little bit more about our plans to ensure that affordability is part of our plan to Thank roll you. out the 100,000 spaces. Well, Speaker, the government talks a lot about creating those child care spaces, but the report that was tabled the other day at the City of Toronto shows very clearly that affordability itself is the key issue here. And the authors are very, very clear, Speaker. They say, quote, simply creating spaces isn't enough. Growth requires requires addressing affordability. This Premier promised to be better on issues like child care, Speaker, but she's let families down. Families and children in this province deserve access to quality, affordable, licensed child care now. We know that child care is a smart investment, Speaker, that supports the economy and helps families to build a future uh, and if they can access it. But the problem is they can't access it. Will this Premier step up and address the affordability crisis that we have Question. in the child care sector here in Ontario. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again for the question. As I mentioned earlier, we have heard from parents and child care professionals about the need for increased access to affordable care, and we have been listening. That's why those conversations are ongoing, and that's why we are committing to making affordability part of our plan when we transform the way we are delivering child care in this province. Now, we are committing to 100,000 new spaces over the next five years, but in addition to that, we are also looking at budget. We've included an operating budget of $600 to $750 million, which will include subsidies and will include a conversation about where those subsidies are needed. So I look forward to chatting with early childhood care uh, workers, also with parents and, of course, with uh, community leaders out there about where the needs Sir? are. But we are providing the City of Toronto $351 million to assist with child care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs. This week is Local Government Week in the province of Ontario. And local governments are the level of government that has the greatest impact on our day-to-day -day lives, Mr. Speaker. There are thousands of people across the province who work hard to make our communities work better for us. Mayors and councillors, school board trustees, firefighters, police officers, paramedics, librarians, planners, bylaw and building inspectors, public health nurses, and many others. Mm -hmm. These workers are opening their doors this week so that young people in our province can see how local government works for us. Great. And school boards also are opening up across the province to teach students about local government. Would the minister provide some detail on some of the efforts surrounding local government week? Thank you. Speaker, thank you very much, and I want to thank the, uh, the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for the question, and I want to thank uh, the Association of Municipal Managers, Clerks and Treasurers of Ontario, as well as he's mentioned in his question, Speaker, local government workers and school boards and associations for the work that they're doing to incent, I believe, and to offer a springboard of opportunity for the next generation of elected people in the province of Ontario. They're doing it through a variety of means, as you've heard in the question, Speaker, through tours, through open houses, and through contests. Speaker, I remember very clearly being elected in 97 to Municipal Council in, in my riding of Thunder Bay, Atacokan, and uh, our clerk at that time, a lady by the name of Elaine Belita, was a tremendous leader in the community of Thunder Bay, incredibly experienced, incredibly sincere and hardworking, and I think that's people like Elaine Belita and the work that they're doing this week in local government week, during local government week, that's going to yield and provide benefit to all of us in the province of Ontario in the years ahead, and I thank them for their efforts. 
Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Minister of Municipal Affairs for his answer. And as he mentioned, the Association of Municipal Managers, Clerks and Treasurers of Ontario uh, is supporting efforts to uh, celebrate Local Government Week. They have materials for students and teachers available online, and these materials do a very good job of outlining how much local government contributes to our day-to-day -day lives. Local governments plan our communities, look after local roads, manage our waste disposal, provide recreation facilities, pools, gyms, parks, libraries. They implement our government's policies in many cases, and any time we're at a park taking our kids to school, visiting a library, or traveling down a street, we're benefiting from the work of our local government. Mr. Speaker, could the minister explain how the government of Ontario Question. is supporting municipalities and local government workers with all of the important, important work they do for Thank us you. every day? Minister. Well, speaker, thank you again to the member for the question. And, and Speaker, I just want to start by saying that as a government, we take our relationship with our municipal partners very seriously. And I think, Speaker, we have demonstrated how seriously we take that relationship in very, very tangible ways. You know, Speaker, when we were first elected in 2003 as government in the province of Ontario, the financial assistance that was flowing to the municipal sector in Ontario was $1.1 billion. Today, Speaker, in 2016, what is it? 13 to 15 years later, total financial assistance through OMPF and our uploads now totals $3.8 billion to the municipal sector. Well, Speaker, Speaker, that's an increase of $2.7 billion, and if you're from Peterborough, like the member from Peterborough, he'd round that up to around $3 billion. Speaker, that represents about 15% on the municipal tax base for the average municipal taxpayer in the province of Ontario that we have provided in assistance through only two of the programs that we are providing to our municipal partners. Thank you. New question, the member from Perry Sound, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Uh, Wait times to receive cataract surgery in Muskoka have tripled. With an aging population, demand for these surgeries is going up year over year, at the same time this government has chosen to fund fewer surgeries. Muskoka Algonquin Healthcare are doing the best they can. In 2015-2016, they performed 253 cataract procedures over and above the number that was funded by the government. These surgeries were performed at an operating loss to try and meet the demand from local communities. Surgery before took six to nine months on the waiting list, but now it takes a year to a year and a half. This is unacceptable. Speaker, will the minister commit to put an end to the increasing wait times and Appreciate help the people of Muskoka and those living in rural Ontario? Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, Muskoka Algonquin Healthcare is a great healthcare organization, and they're doing a fantastic job in providing care to members of their community. We, uh, to, in part through the increased funding in the budget this year, and to recognize the important work that they're doing and the, the needs that they have, that we increased their budget by over $500,000 this year alone, which is helping them uh, to continue to uh, provide those the important services. But, Mr. Speaker, I have to, because cataracts were, were mentioned, I have to go back to the fact that the Fraser Institute themselves gave us a straight A as a province, specifically on our delivery of cataract procedures when they're looking at wait times. This is the Wait Time Alliance report card, Mr. Speaker, and they uh, they gave us a straight A in five different areas. Yes, I've already yes, referenced the others, but they gave us a straight A in cataract. Is there more work to be done? Of course. That's what this new money, the half a million dollars, is going to help Thank do. you. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 13, an act in respect to the cost of electricity. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
members please take their seats. All members, please take your seats. Thank you. On October the 18th, 2016, Mr. Thibault moved the third reading of Bill 13. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Napier. Mr. Napier. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Orizetti. Mr. Orizetti. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Domerlon. Ms. Domerlon. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassen. Ms. Jassen. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cabot. Mr. Cabot. Mr. Sayers. Mr. Sayers. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jolina. Madame Jolina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Carried. Third reading of the bill, twentieth lecture, projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This house stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.